for the next several weeks, um, Unit 3 is going to be about civil liberties and civil rights. Um, you need to know the difference between the two. Uh, for this week and probably most of next week, we're going to be focusing on civil liberties. Civil liberties are guarantees of freedoms um, that protect you from arbitrary government intervention, that protects your lives from being completely controlled by the government. So. An easy way to remember this is civil liberties are the guarantees of freedoms that protect you from the government. Um, these are things that keep your life from being completely controlled by the government. And these protections, these freedoms, these guarantees of freedoms can be easily found because we have a section in the U.S. Constitution that lists these freedoms, and that is known as the Bill of Rights. If you all remember, there was a big debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists um, before the Constitution was ratified. Uh, for the simple fact that it did not have a Bill of Rights in the beginning. This was something the anti-federals were adamant about including into the U.S. Constitution because they felt unsafe without having a Bill of Rights. A Bill of Rights lists these guarantees of freedoms. They list your civil liberties. They list the freedoms that government is not supposed to unreasonably take away from you. Um, that's what we're going to be focusing on for the next several weeks in this class. Now, the argument on the federal side about not including a Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution was a practical one. Um, they believe that if we start listing the things that government is not able to do, it would imply that whatever whatever is not on the list, government can take away and can violate. Um, so they'd rather not have a Bill of Rights and allow the U.S. government to be limited just by the Constitution, because the Constitution only lists the powers of government. So whatever is not on the list, government cannot do. So H Hamilton and Madison, this is what they were arguing. If we include a Bill of Rights, we're going to break the Constitution. The Constitution works because it lists, it tells us the powers of government. Whatever is not on the list, it is implied that government cannot do. But if we start adding things, to the Constitution, if we start adding a Bill of Rights to the Constitution that lists the things that government cannot do, you are inevitably implying that whatever is not on the list, that's a freedom, that's a right that government can take away. So the argument is for Hamilton is we don't need a right to bear arms. We don't need to list that specifically because government wasn't given that power in the first place. Government does not have the power to take people's guns away in the first place. We don't need to list down freedom of speech because government does not have the power to take away people's right to express themselves anyway. It is actually dangerous to add a Bill of Rights because that would mean um, that whatever is not on that list of rights or, or guarantees of freedom, government can take away. But ultimately, a Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution of the United States. That's why they're called the first 10 amendments. They were the first 10 changes to the Constitution. Um, in this class, you're going to need to know um, your rights and specific guarantees of freedom found in these amendments. I'm going to highlight the ones that you need to remember. Um, most of you probably do from your eighth grade classes, from your U.S. history classes. Um, but if you don't, now's the time to learn them because they might be asked on your AP exam. The First Amendment guarantees five provisions of freedom. This is the most important amendment in the United States. It guarantees speech, especially when it comes to political speech even speech or expression that might be critical of the government is protected by the First Amendment. So you can talk bad about President Biden, you can talk, um, you can be critical of Congress, you can be critical of your state government if you want to. These are expressions that are protected. The whole reason why we have freedom of speech is we wanted to allow, our founding fathers wanted to allow people to be able to express themselves even against the government. Uh, we have the right of freedom of the press, which means journalists in this country can report on whatever they want to report on, can um, write stories about whatever they want. Uh, we have freedom of petition. This is something very important to our founding fathers. They wanted people to have the ability to go to government. This is important. This is going to be on your exam. To go to government and um, communicate with people in government and tell them about their grievances, tell them about their problems, tell, tell them about their interests so that government can make policy that would reflect those interests, that would reflect those problems. This was something that our founding fathers felt like was denied to them under the British Empire, under the British government. So they 
made sure that this is something that can never happen in this country. That if people want to be heard by the people that are supposed to represent them, they have the right to be heard. So right now, you can write your congressman. You can go to Washington, D.C., or you can go to Austin, and you can try to talk to these people. You have freedom of petition. You have freedom of assembly, which is, again, something very dear to our founding fathers, being able to get together, being able to um, create political parties, being able to create interest groups. These are things that are um, very important for our founding fathers because they felt like that was denied to them under the British government. And finally, you have freedom of religion. We're going to talk about freedom of religion more in that um, once we get to that section. Um, but you need to know what freedom of religion actually guarantees. Because some of you have a vague idea what freedom of religion means, uh, but you may not know what it actually means. You have a superficial idea of freedom of religion. A lot of you believe that freedom of religion means that you can believe in whatever you want to believe in. You can already do that. You don't need text in the Constitution for that. The government cannot really stop you from believing in whatever you want to believe in. Right now, some of you right now may be thinking about sex and not listening to me, and there's nothing I can do about it. I can't control what goes on in your head. There's really no need to protect the ability of someone to believe in whatever they want to believe in. Freedom of religion guarantees two different things. If you look at what it says in the Constitution, this is the first um, phrase in the, um, the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. From that sentence, we get two of the most important clauses in, when, it when it comes to freedom of religion in the country. We have the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, both of which guarantee two different things that you need to remember. Let's talk about the easy one first, the free exercise clause. The free exercise clause says government, which says Congress or government cannot make any law that would prohibit the free exercise of religion, which means not only can you believe in whatever you want to believe in, you can practice that belief. That's the important thing. That's what needs to be protected, not the ability to believe because that's something that government cannot really take away from people but the ability to practice and exercise that belief. You have the free exercise clause. Government cannot prohibit the free exercise of religion. So what does that mean? Not only can you believe in Christianity, but not only can you believe in the tenets of Catholicism or Islam, but you can practice those beliefs. You can go to Sunday mass. You can um, pray to Allah five times a day if you're a Muslim. You can get baptized. You can go to confession and get communion. And government is not allowed to prohibit those practices. That's what the free exercise clause guarantees, that in this country, for the most part, although there are some exceptions we'll talk about later on, the practice of a religion is something that government cannot prohibit. That's what the free exercise clause guarantees to us all. Now, for most Americans, that's something that's obvious. That's something that most Americans agree that should be protected. The gray area or the controversy about freedom of religion rests on the other clause of freedom of religion, which is the establishment clause. Let's read it again. Government shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What does that mean? In the United States, government cannot establish a national religion. That's what the establishment clause guarantees, that in this country, our government, when it comes to the question of religion, will remain neutral. We don't have a national religion. In some countries, they do. In most Middle Eastern countries, Islam is their national religion. In the Vatican City, Catholicism is their national religion. In the United States, that is for, forbidden by the Constitution, specifically in the Establishment Clause. Even though 70% of Americans would identify themselves as some form of Christian, this is not a Christian country. Our government is not a Christian government. It cannot be. It's specifically for, prohibited from being one by the Constitution's Establishment Clause. What that means also is that government cannot favor with its policies, with its laws, with the things that it decides. Government cannot favor one religion 
over another religion. It cannot promote another religion while knocking another one down. It has to remain neutral in the question of religion, even if the majority of this country might want the United States to make policies that would be more favorable towards Christians because we are a majority Christian. That cannot be the case. Because our founding fathers wanted to ensure that even if you are a religious minority in the United States, that the Christian majority is not going to be able to impose policies or government policies against you. So government cannot play favorites between religion because if it starts favoring one religion, it means that it would be establishing a religion which is specifically prohibited by the Constitution's um, Establishment Clause. So this is something where we get to gray area because a lot of Christians in the United States feel like, you know what, they deserve preferential treatment. They deserve favorable policies because they are the majority. But you should know if you're one of these people that believe this, if, you're, if your parents are one of the people that believe this, that cannot be the case. Our founding fathers specifically prohibited that. The establishment clause, here's how I want you to remember it, creates a wall of separation between church and state between religion and government there exists a wall and that wall is the first amendment's establishment clause it prohibits government and religion from intermingling too much it prohibits the government from making policies that would be favorable towards one religion and that would knock another religion down uh, when we get to controversies would be like in school for example school is a government institution i am a government employee if tomorrow I start preaching to you about Jesus, then I would be in violation of the Establishment Clause. I would be breaching that separation established by, by, by this clause. If Ms. Kaufman on the intercom starts praying to Allah, she would be in violation of the Establishment Clause. Religion and government are not able to mix together. Anyone have any questions over this? Make sure you remember your two clauses of freedom of religion, the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, and what they both guarantee. One guarantees the free practice of religion without government intervention. The other one guarantees that our government cannot establish a national religion in the United States, nor favor one religion over another. The Second Amendment is very easy. It guarantees two things, the right of a state to form a militia, which is a volunteer army, and the right to bear arms. Um, there are many people in the United States, especially people who are against, not against, uh, that want to limit the Second Amendment, who are for gun control policies. There are some people that believe that the right to form a militia, which is guaranteed by the Second Amendment, is tied to the right to bear arms, that only the militia formed by the states, these volunteer armies formed by the states, are the ones with the right to bear arms, that it's not really guaranteed to everybody. But this is, again, this is why the Constitution is so problematic. The vagueness of the wording of the Constitution allows for different interpretation. Um, but for the most part, most Americans accept that every American does have the right to bear arms. Where, where it comes to controversy nowadays is what types of guns and what are some limitations that government can put on the Second Amendment? Should there be any limitations to who can own a gun and what type of guns can be owned? Should there be gun control? The United States has the highest rate of deaths by far um, when it comes to guns. We, we, the second place country, I think it's the Philippines, doesn't even come close. Why is that? Because in other countries, even though they may have Bill of Rights, they may have guarantees of freedom, they don't really have a version of the Second Amendment in most countries. Like in Japan and Germany, their governments are able to infringe people's access to guns and who can own weapons. And they and government is able to limit it uh, very strictly. In the United States, government is not allowed to do that because the Second Amendment is there. But as a result, we have these violence that happens every day in the United States. People die every day because of guns. We have school shootings and we have shootings in concerts. So this is something that you're going to have to struggle with. As you grow up, what is going to be more important for you? And this is the struggle of this unit. You have to decide which one is more important, this civil liberty, this guarantee of freedom, or people's safety, or people's protection? Are you going to be willing to sacrifice some freedoms 
in order to protect people. And what are those freedoms that are you going to be willing to sacrifice? Is the Second Amendment a freedom that we should be able to discard and limit uh, for the protection of people's lives? All right, Third Amendment, not important in this class, but it was important for our founding fathers. Government cannot force you to house soldiers into your houses. Um, very important for our founding fathers, not so much today because um, our military is well-funded. They're not going to need us to take in soldiers. In, they spend like trillions of dollars every year on the military. That's not something that's probably not going to be an issue in the United States for a very long time. The Fourth Amendment to the Constitution is important. The Fourth Amendment guarantees freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. Freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. According to the Constitution of the United States Fourth Amendment, before they can search or take away your property, they need to have what we call a probable cause. A probable cause just basically means a good reason. Before they can get a warrant for your uh, to search your property, before they can search your property directly, they need to have a probable cause. Without a probable cause, it would be an illegal search and seizure. It would be a violation of your Fourth Amendment rights. What happens if authorities, like the police, for example, barges into your house without probable cause, without a warrant, without probable cause to get a warrant, or without probable cause directly? What happens if that's the case? Anybody know, those of you that watch courtroom dramas, does anybody know what happens if the authorities conduct an illegal search and seizure that it would be a violation of your Fourth Amendment rights? All that evidence is thrown away. Very good. Whatever they find during that illegal search, even if it's incriminating evidence, cannot be used against you in the court of law. If they barge into my apartment and they find a mountain load of cocaine, if it was an illegal search, they can't use that against me. It would be inadmissible evidence. We're going to talk about this further in the future, but this is called the exclusionary rule. They have to exclude it from consideration in court. It's inadmissible evidence. They can find a dead hooker on my bed during an illegal search, but they cannot use that against me in the court of law. Anyone have any questions so far? When it comes to the Fourth Amendment, um, one of the major issues the United States is facing today is about government surveillance, especially after 9-11, and how government empowered some of the federal bureaucracies that we've just got done talking about with broad surveillance capabilities to collect data on our communications, to collect text messages and emails, should government be able to do that if it meant protecting people's lives, if it meant discovering another terrorist plot that we can prevent? Is it worth it to sacrifice your Fourth Amendment's right to privacy um, in order to protect the United States? It's the same question as the Second Amendment. And you're going to have to decide which liberties are worth sacrificing and which ones are not. Let's go to the Fifth Amendment. The, 15, the Fifth Amendment houses multiple freedoms. The two that I need you to remember for this class is the first two. First one is freedom from self-incrimination. Government cannot force you to testify against yourself. Government cannot force you to bear witness against yourself, to incriminate yourself in the court of law. That's why people say the Fifth Amendment is the right to remain silent. If you are ever accused of a crime, they cannot force you to talk. They cannot force you to reveal information that you don't want to reveal. A lot of people get scared and they start talking and that could be detrimental to your case because whatever you say um, during interrogation can be used against you in the court of law. While the Fifth Amendment guarantees that you don't have to, that they cannot force you to do so. The Fifth Amendment guarantees the right to remain silent or freedom from self-incrimination. The second one I need you to remember on this is the right to due process. Due process means fair treatment under the law. According to the Fifth Amendment, the U.S. government cannot take away your life, your liberty, or your property. Cannot take away your life by executing you, your liberty by putting you in jail, your property by confiscating what you own. 
without going through due process, which means treating you fairly under the law. If you are ever accused of a crime, every single right that we're going to be talking about today should be guaranteed to you. If not, they violated your right to due process and they cannot take away anything from you, your life, your liberty, your property, according to the Fifth Amendment. They need to treat you fairly under the law. What that means is all the freedoms that we just talked about have to be guaranteed to you. If not, then um, they cannot use it against you in the court of law. They cannot, they cannot take away your life, your liberty, or your property. Next is um, no double jeopardy. Those of you that remember from eighth grade, you cannot be tried for the same crime twice. If I was found not guilty of a crime, I am not guilty of that crime for the rest of my life. Um, they cannot keep putting me on trial for the same thing. And finally, eminent domain. According to the Fifth Amendment, government cannot take away your property, but there's a caveat to that, without just compensation. What the Fifth Amendment is basically saying is, yes, government can take away your property as long as they compensate you justly or correctly. So let's say that your house is in, the, is in the middle of a highway that they're gonna be, that government wants to build. They can confiscate your property. They can take away your house so that they can build that highway. However, the Fifth Amendment guarantees that you receive just compensation, that they pay you for your property. So it's not like the Fifth Amendment completely protects your right to property. It just says that if they are gonna take away your property, they have to compensate you justly. Anyone have any questions about the Fifth Amendment? For my class, these are the two you need to remember. All right, let's go to the Sixth Amendment. Um, the Sixth Amendment guarantees a multitude of freedoms, especially um, for the accused, people who, are, who have been accused of crimes in the United States. You have the right to a speedy trial. Trials in the United States won't take several years usually. They would take usually generally a few months or a few weeks. Um, you have the right to trial by jury for criminal cases. So in the United States, there's this misconception that um, usually it is the judge that decide if you're guilty or not guilty. That is not the case. What they do is they oversee the case, and they usually, if you are found guilty, they usually are the ones that decide what punishment you will get according to the law. The people generally that decide who is guilty or not guilty in the United States is a jury of your peers. Um, those of you that watch courtroom dramas or movies, they're the people that sit on one side of the courtroom. They are the ones that the lawyers for both the defendant and the prosecution have to convince that you may, may or may not have done the crime. They're the ones that decide your fate, whether you're guilty or you're not guilty. That's your right. As an American, you have the right to trial by jury. Someday, some of you will be part of juries because this is your constitutional duty. You're going to be summoned to become a juror in a case, and you're going to be deciding somebody's, um, somebody's innocence or guilt. Um, as an American citizen, this is one of your constitutional duties. Next, trials will take place where the crime took place. So if I stole a Snickers bar in Arizona, the trial will take place in Arizona. If I'm accused of killing somebody in New York, my trial will take place in New York. This is something very important to our founding fathers because when they were under the British government, they were taken away. When they were accused of a crime, they were taken away from the colonies and they were shipped off to England to have their trial where they did not have any friends or support and they were probably found guilty. So to make sure that will never happen again, the Sixth Amendment guarantees that trials will take place where the crime took place. Next, you have the right to a lawyer or right to a counsel. This is the one I need you to remember for the Sixth Amendment. We're going to come back to this later on. The right to a counsel is guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment. Somebody that would defend you in the court of law if you cannot do that yourself. You have the right to a counsel. And nowadays, if you cannot afford one, the government will uh, provide you with one. You'll, you'll see why later on. Go ahead and put a number five in the chat for me, please. I'll give you five seconds to do so.
All right. Let's go ahead and continue. The Seventh Amendment to the Constitution of the United States guarantees the right to trial by jury for civil cases. While the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to trial by jury for criminal cases, the Seventh Amendment guarantees that right for civil cases. The difference between a criminal case and a civil case is a criminal case is there's a question of whether or not you broke the law. In a civil case, it is a dispute, an argument between, a disagreement between two parties or two people. There may, there may or may not be a question of somebody breaking the law. So again, a criminal case, which the Sixth Amendment guarantees that you have the right to trial by jury for criminal cases, involves the question of whether or not a law is being broken, while a civil case, the Seventh Amendment guarantees that you have the right to trial by jury for a civil case, involves two parties having a disagreement. So for example, murder, rape, robbery, those are all criminal cases. Speeding would be a criminal case because you're technically breaking the law. Those of you that speed in this class, you are technically a criminal. Give me a example of civil cases. What could be a, what could a civil case be about? Divorce proceedings, very good. Those, um, custody battles of who's going to be taking care of you, for example. Those of you who've ever been children of divorce, which statistically like half of you would probably be a, ch a child of divorce, if there ever fight about whether or not you, uh, who's gonna be taking care of you, who's gonna be holding custody of you, then that would be a civil case. Um, if you and your neighbors are fighting about um, who owns this plot of land, uh, where does his fence begin and where does your la land end? That would be a civil case also. There's not necessarily a question of whether or not somebody's breaking the law or not, although there could be later on. Um, that, but that would be, a, if you ever involved in a car accident and you didn't work it out with your insurance companies, that would also be a civil case. Anyone have any questions so far? Seventh Amendment, not important. It's like the Third Amendment. You can forget about it for, from now on. This one is important. The Eighth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. How, how I remember it, how I make my kids in eighth grade remember it when I used to teach eighth grade is, imagine a noose sh shaped like an eighth. In the United States, we no longer hang people for offenses for crimes because the Eighth Amendment guarantees no cruel or unusual punishment. You have freedom from cruel and unusual punishment in this country, even if you are found guilty of a crime and they cannot punish you for that crime in a cruel or unusual manner. That's why we don't torture people in the United, oh, we're not supposed to torture people in the United States. That's why we don't cut people's limbs off. We don't cut people's heads off. In other countries, if you rape a woman, they cut off your genitals or they sterilize you so you can never be turned on and never have kids ever again. In the United States, we find those forms of punishment as too cruel and unusual and the Eighth Amendment guarantees protections from that. Even for our most heinous citizens, we cannot punish them in a cruel and unusual man manner. This became a topic, those of you that remember, I know some, most of you are, are, were too young, but there was this bombing at the Boston Marathon a couple of years ago or several years ago, and the suspect was an American citizen. He committed a terrorist act. And a lot of people in the United States really, really wanted him to get punished. And they really wanted the government to do bad things to him. But the Eighth Amendment protects everyone, even our most heinous people, from being treated cruelly or unusually. Um, does anybody know the controversies behind the Eighth Amendment today is concerning which type of punishment? When we're talking about the Eighth Amendment, it's all about the death penalty. Very good. A death penalty, capital punishment, whether or not that is a form of cruel and unusual punishment. There, there's debates going on throughout the United States if that, should, that form of punishment should be allowed or is it a violation of the Eighth Amendment. On one side, you have people that say there are some crimes so bad, so heinous that the, eighth, the death penalty is justified. It's a justifiable form of punishment to give to people who commit the most heinous of crimes. And then you have the other side would say that how can you put people to death when we know our conviction rate in the United States is not always 100% perfect. 
that we find people guilty who are actually innocent. Even if it's just 99.99%, even if it's just 0.001% of people who are found guilty that are innocent, are we gonna leave that up to chance? Are we gonna uh, be able to put somebody to death for that? Um, and what could be more cruel than taking away somebody's life? Should government be able to do that? Again, that's something that you're gonna have to struggle with as you're growing up. There are questions about these civil liberties. It's not like a lot of these are set in stone. Ninth Amendment, this is the one I need to teach all the time because you were thought the Ninth Amendment wrong. I guarantee you in your eighth grade classes, they say the Ninth Amendment, freedom to the people. What the hell does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. You need to know what the Ninth Amendment says. When you woke up this morning and you took a shower or you took a dump, did you have the right to do that? Those of you here who are irresponsible, during spring break, when you go to the beach, do you have the right to do that? Where does it say in your Bill of Rights that you have the right to take a dump in the morning? Does it say that in the Fifth Amendment, the Second? If your right to blink or your right to take a nap is not listed in the Bill of Rights, does that mean government can control it? Does that mean government can restrict it? Does that mean tomorrow Texas can pass a law that says Texans are not allowed to take naps or they're not allowed to take a dump in the morning? So this is the problem the Ninth Amendment solves. The Ninth Amendment recognizes that we have personal freedoms, like my right to wear glasses, your right to wake up, your right to blink your eyes. There are so many personal freedoms that we can't possibly list them all in the Bill of Rights. So what the Ninth Amendment says is, you are still guaranteed these rights, even if they are non enumerated, if they are, even if they're not enumerated in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. You have personal freedoms, like being able to wear whatever clothes you want, or being able to wear glasses, taking a dump in the morning. You have personal freedoms that are unlisted, but they are still protected. Think of the Ninth Amendment like an umbrella. It covers your unlisted personal freedoms. It kind of fixes a lot of Alexander Hamilton's concerns because Hamilton, a Federalist, was concerned about a Bill of Rights being added and be, the, some of the rights not being listed in the Bill of Rights. Well, the Ninth Amendment solves some of that problems. You have personal freedoms, according to the Ninth Amendment, that are still protected, that are still guaranteed. It's like an umbrella amendment that covers your unlisted personal freedoms. Anyone have any questions over the Ninth Amendment? Go to the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. You should know this already. A Tenth Amendment symbolizes federalism in the United States. Um, whatever power is not given to the U.S. government by the Constitution of the United States, what's the word I'm looking for? Are what? Powers not given by the Constitution to the U.S. government are what? Implied. I'm looking for another word. If the Constitution, very good, Ivana, reserved, reserved to whom? Reserved to the states. Powers not given by the Constitution to the U.S. government or to the federal government are reserved to the states. This is one of these things in the Constitution that invokes the principle of federalism, that we give authority to both the U.S. government and we give authority to the state governments as well. That's what the Tenth Amendment is about. And whenever the U.S. government tries to infringe upon powers that are reserved to the states, the, the state governments use the 10th Amendment as a shield to protect themselves from federal government infringement. So this, the principle evoked in this is federalism. We talked about that before. All right, this is our main topic today that I need you to listen to. In 1833, the Supreme Court heard a case called Baltimore, um, Barron versus Baltimore. In Barron versus Baltimore, a citizen in Maryland in the state of Baltimore complained that his city violated his freedom of speech. I'm not going to give you the facts of the case because you don't need to remember the name of this case. What you need to remember is what the Supreme Court decided about 200 years ago. The Supreme Court decided that the protections of freedoms 
that are found in the Bill of Rights only applied to the U.S. government or the federal government. It did not apply to the state and local governments. So freedom of speech, the right to bear arms, those freedoms, according to the Supreme Court decision in Barron versus Baltimore, only applied to the federal government, only limited the federal government. If a state wanted to, if a local government wanted to, they can violate those freedoms because the Bill of Rights, according to the Constitution, only protected you from the federal government, from the U.S. government, but not from your state or local governments. I need you to remember that. 200 years ago, this is what the Supreme Court decided. The Bill of Rights or the protections of freedoms that are found in the Bill of Rights only protected you from the federal government. It did not apply to the state and local governments. It did not protect you from the state and local governments. Any questions so far? But things are going to change. So this was a big, big victory for the state and local governments because the Supreme Court is basically telling them is, if you wanted to, you can make policies that violate people's freedom of religion. You can make policies that violate people's right to bear arms because those protections do not apply to you. They only apply to the federal and the U.S. government. But then the Civil War came along, and then after the Civil War was over, they added three amendments to the Constitution of the United States, including the most important amendment for this class, which is the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment houses two clauses that are very paramount to U.S. government or to this class specifically. Anybody remember what those two clauses were? Equal protection would be one. Very good, Samantha. What's the other one called? No state shall deprive. Very good. Uh, no due process clause. No state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That's a due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. That's the equal protection clause on that, first, uh, on that last clause of the 14th Amendment. We talked about these clauses before and how important they are. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment bans, I want you to look at that, look how it starts, state. By state, they mean government, any government, whether it be the U.S. government, whether it be the state governments, or whether it be the local governments, they cannot deprive you of due process of law or equal protection of the law. The Equal Protection Clause says that no government can discriminate on you based on your gender, the color of your skin, your religion. If they do, if they make a policy that would be discriminatory against your sex, against your sexual orientation, against your religion, or against your race, they would be in violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. That's not what's important today. What's important is the other one today, the Due Process Clause. Look what it says. No state can deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This is not the first time you see due process today. Where else is the right to due process found in the Constitution? Based on what we talked about today, where else can you find that you have the right to due process? That your life, your liberty, or your property cannot be taken away without equal treatment or fair treatment under the law. The Fifth Amendment, very good, Ivana. In the Fifth Amendment, it guarantees the right to due process. But according to Barron versus Baltimore, that only applied to which government? What is the difference between the due process clause found in the Fifth Amendment and the due process clause found in the Fourteenth Amendment? According to the Supreme Court case Barron versus Baltimore, the provisions of the Bill of Rights, including the Fifth Amendment, only apply to whom? Only apply to the federal government, to the U.S. government. It did not apply to the state. So here's the difference. Look at the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. What word is the difference?
what word is what we're looking at that is very important in this particular amendment? Jurisdiction, state. Thank you, Jason and Samantha. State. No government, including the state governments, can deprive you of due process of law without, uh, would deprive any person of life, liberty, or prop uh, property without due process of law. So there are two words in the 14th Amendment that we need to talk about. State, which means any government, including the state and local governments, and liberty. The Supreme Court has interpreted the due process clause of the 14th Amendment as a way to incorporate or apply provisions of the Bill of Rights to the state governments. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment allows the freedoms and the protections in the, found in the Bill of Rights to be applied to the state and local governments also. Because it says, no state can deprive you of liberty without due process of law. So the Supreme Court interpreted that to mean that no government, including the state and local governments, can take away your freedoms even the freedoms found in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. What the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause allowed the courts to do is to apply provisions and protections of freedom in the Bill of Rights to the state and local governments, when before the 14th Amendment, those freedoms and protections only apply to the federal government. Any questions about this? So the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause allows for incorporation. What does that mean? The application of freedoms or guarantees of freedoms to the state and local governments. When it used to be, they only apply to the U.S. government. The 14th Amendment has allowed the incorporation or the application of these freedoms to the state and local governments. However, guys, it is not total incorporation. Not every freedom or guarantee of freedom in the Bill of Rights could be applied to the state governments and local governments all at once. The Supreme Court didn't say definitively that all of the freedoms found in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution applies to the state and local government. They did not say that. They said what we're going to do is instead of total incorporation, we're going to have selective incorporation. So what do I mean by selective incorporation? What it means is the, provision, the provisions of the Bill of Rights, of freedoms, the guarantees of freedoms in the Bill of Rights will be applied to the states one by one in a case by case basis. The Supreme Court will evaluate each provision of the Bill of Rights and determine whether or not they should be applied to the state and local governments. They're not going to apply it wholesale. They're not gonna apply all the freedoms of the Bill of Rights to the state and local governments, they're gonna apply it one by one on a case by case basis. This is known as selective incorporation and you need to remember this in your head. The provisions of the Bill of Rights will be applied to the states one by one in a case by case basis via the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Now, to be incorporated, the Supreme Court has two criteria. Number one, somebody has to complain that their state and local government is violating that freedom. Number two, the Supreme Court has to determine that that freedom, and this is the word I need you to remember, is fundamental to liberty, fundamental to freedom. What does that mean? Significant, important, and necessary. The Supreme Court has to decide, you know what, that freedom is too important, it's too necessary for it not to be applied to the state and local governments. That's the two criteria they need to talk about. Number one, somebody has to complain that their local government or the state government policies are infringing upon a freedom. And then number two, the Supreme Court will take that case and then they will decide, you know what, that freedom is fundamental, it is an essential freedom, and it needs to be applied to the state and local governments. Anyone have any questions so far? So here's what I want you to look at. These are the cases that we call incorporation cases. I know it's hard to see, but these are the cases that the Supreme Court applied provisions of the Bill of Rights to the state and local governments. The first one was Gitlow versus New York in 1925. The Supreme Court incorporated the First Amendment's freedom of speech to the state and local governments. 
Then one by one, provisions of the Bill of Rights will be incorporated to the state and local governments. Can anybody see um, the last freedom that was incorporated to the state and local governments? No cruel and unusual punishment of the Eighth Amendment was incorporated in 1962. That's fairly recent by Robinson versus California, but it's not, that's, not the, that's not the latest one. Over here, guys. A right to bear arms incorporated in McDonald's versus Chicago in 2010, just about 10 years ago. But if you notice, guys, there are some freedoms in the Bill of Rights not incorporated that do not apply to the states. Like, for example, the Third Amendment, no quartering of soldiers. That has not been incorporated yet. The Seventh Amendment, right to trial by jury for civil cases, not incorporated yet. Maybe later on the Supreme Court will find that those rights are fundamental. But for right now, those do not apply to the state and local governments yet. But this is known as selective incorporation, that we're going to apply the guarantees of freedom and the Bill of Rights one by one via or through the 14th Amendment due process clause. I want you to put a number two in the chat for me, please. You got five seconds to do so. All right, no, this limits the power of the state and local governments. As one by one, these provisions in the Bill of Rights are being applied to them, that means they can no longer make policies that would violate those. So they get weaker and weaker as more and more of the provisions of the Bill of Rights are incorporated and applied to them. However, for the federal government, this is a good thing. Because as those provisions of the Bill of Rights are applied to the state and local governments, they can hold the states accountable for violating those rights. Somebody has to say, you know what, states, that provision of the Bill of Rights has been incorporated to you. You're not allowed to violate that any longer. Specifically, which branch of the federal government will hold the states accountable for the violation of provisions of, of freedom that are applied to the states, that have been incorporated to the states? Who's going to be, which branch of the U.S. government is going to be most responsible for that? Very good. The judicial branch, using their power of judicial review. Guys, that's what they usually use judicial review on. They use it on the states. And they use it because they violated provisions of the Bill of Rights that have been applicable or that have been incorporated or applied to them. So as more and more rights are being applied to the state and local governments, the state governments are getting weaker and weaker while the authority of the judicial branch of the United States government is getting more and more powerful because they can hold those states accountable for violating those rights that have been incorporated or applied. Think of it this way. Think of the 14th Amendment's due process clause like a sponge. It soaks up the provisions and the freedoms of the Bill of Rights, and then drip by drip, we let it drip onto the state and local governments. Are all the freedoms incorporated all at once? Is it total incorporation? No. Only some of the freedoms have been incorporated and have been applied to the states. It's, it's going to be on a case-by-case, one-by-one basis. And they have to determine that it is a fundamental right. All right, guys. Just, I know um, I'm, I'm making you go over time. I'll tell you I'll put in the results of your test because there's some people that haven't taken it yet here make sure you take it guys um, but for your assignments you are all those of you that put that pass both of my checks to put a five in the beginning and two at the end if you pass both of them then you don't need to do this you don't need to do this ed puzzle unit three lesson one you're only responsible for this six minute selective incorporation ed puzzle if you did not pass both of my checks, you need to do both because that means you weren't paying attention, you weren't listening, and you need that information. Anyone have any questions on that, guys?
We'll talk about your federal bureaucracy test tomorrow. I'll uh, hopefully get all those done, grading them by tomorrow. You guys have a good day. If you have any questions, you can remain behind and I'll try to answer whatever questions you may have. Bye, sir. Have a great day. Have a good day. Bye, sir. Have a nice day. You too. Oh, series, Asher, any questions?